Okay, let's get started. Welcome. Welcome to the last session of the uh, FERA Flash Talks and the last session for 2022. Um, I am Lisa Rani, Director of Research at FERA. Uh, we have a tight schedule today. We have uh, six presenters, six young investigators that uh, will share us, with us their FA research um, in only five minutes. Uh, after each presentation, we'll have some time for questions and please type them in the Q&A box. Remember to use the Q&A box and not the chat box. All the sessions are recorded and uh, they are posted on YouTube. Um, and at the end of the webinar, uh, please complete a short survey to rate the talks based on the criteria that you see here. Um, and uh, we'll award the um, highest rated presentations. Um, our moderator today is Mary Nadon Scott. She'll be introducing the speakers and, and take your questions. Um, Mary, you're in charge. Hello, my name is Mary Nathan Scott, I'm 40 years old. I was diagnosed with FA about 20 years ago. I live in Vermont with my husband and our four kids, and I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, our first presenter here today is... Maheshwaran um, Kasimam from Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, and the talk is going to be about can we slow down the GAA repeat expansion over time? Thank you for the introduction, Mary. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen and hear me okay? Yep. Okay, let's get it started. Hello everyone, I'm Mahesh, a graduate student in University Laval, Canada, supervised by Dr. Pete Tremblay. I am currently working in Dr. Ricardo Moro Pinto's lab in Massachusetts General Hospital studying on somatic GA expansions as a potential therapeutic target for phytic ataxia. I've been working on phytic ataxia for the past three to four years trying to find a cure. As we all know that the GA expansions in phytic ataxia causes the toxin protein to be lowered and in turn leads to FA. These GA repeats vary from 70 to 1700 repeats. The longer the GA repeats, the less protein is made and that leads to earlier onset of the disease. The interesting thing about the GA repeat is that these repeats are not stable. By that, I mean these repeats gets expanded when inherited from the parents to the child. It doesn't stop there. It keeps expanding in that patients throughout their lives. And this is called somatic expansion or somatic instabilities. Here's a diagram that explains somatic expansions. Here you can see these green neurons with 500 GA repeats in the early stage of the disease. These gets expanded with age from 500 to 800 that's marked in yellow and further to 1200 that's marked in red. We speculate that this could be due to expansions and this could make the neuron sick. If that's true, we, we hypothesize that can preventing these expansions delay the progression of the disease and delay the age of onset. Here we show that the neurons that gets sick over time is stopped by a drug that stops somatic expansions and stabilize the repeats. Can this stabilizing slow or stop the symptoms? Our next question was, how to stop these expansions? To answer that question, we need to know how the expansions occurs in FRDA. With previous studies have showed that the DNA repair mechanism is involved. Here's a diagram showing uh, expanded GA repeats in one of the fritaxin allele, which tends to form abnormal structures called triplexes 
represented as a knot. These structures are resolved by a DNA repair proteins that's represented as a mechanic here. Errors in resolving these structures leads to J expansions. These expanded J repeats again tend to form these structures and gets expanded. This happens over and over again throughout the patient's life. There are a number of DNA repair proteins present in the cell. We are interested in a particular protein called MSH3 due to its safety profile when it comes to therapeutics. The next logical question was to what happens if we inactivate this mechanic guy in the cell? To do that, we took two FA mice and we inactivated the MSH3 in one of the mice. So here is the picture with active MSH3, which has an expansion in liver and brain. When we inactivate the MSH3, we can see that there is a drastic drop in the expansion in liver and brain, which is plotted in the graph showing that there is a huge drop when there is a knockout or inactivation of the mechanic guy, also known as MSH3. Farah was generous in funding us to take this study further where we wanted to inactivate the mechanic guy in one of the mouse in all the cells and all the tissues and compare it with the normal mice and see what happens. The question we asked ourselves is, what is the role of GA expansions in Friedrich ataxia? Can it increase or increase the frataxin levels in patients? Can it stop the damage caused to the neurons? Even better, can it make the sick mice better? As these are going to be further treated in the patients, we wanted to establish a cellular model where we take the skin cells from the patients and convert them into stem cells. These stem cells can be programmed to different cells. We are interested in creating heart cells and neurons as these are the primarily affected in FA. With these human environment models, we wanted to address the same questions in mice. With this, I end my talk and wanted to thank Locus and Farah for the funding. I, I wanted to specially mention my PI for giving me a great opportunity to present here with Farah. I'm open to take questions. Thank you. Yay, wonderful. I have um, several questions coming in. <laughs> Um, let's see there first. Sorry, I'm supposed to click on it. Um, what, what age time points have shown GAA expansion? What ages have the we done evaluation in mice? Um, so we have looked at. 12 weeks and um, 24 weeks, we both have showed expansions and after MSH3 inactivation, both have showed the decrease of expansion as well. Um, let's see, There's so many questions. I lost the order. What about, um, does the level of protection reduce with age? Uh, yes. So as the repeat gets larger, the protection gets lowered eventually, but it, it never goes to zero, which is kind of interesting for us. Is, is that a threshold that it doesn't go below that? Is it because the expansion doesn't have an effect after that? point or something that we are investigating currently. Great, thank you. Um, and um, Liz, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, we can do, we can do one more. Okay. Um, how about um, what mouse model was used? Oh, uh, the diagram that I've shown here we used YG8S mouse with 300 GA repeats. All right, thank you. And there are two other questions in the Q&A box. 
if you have a chance, do you yeah. think that you answer those? Yeah, right. sure. Thank you Thank so you. much. Our next presenter that we have to, let me get my favor, sorry. My poor F.A. reach is um, Ernan um, Gentili from University of Buenos Aires. Um, and um, the talk is creating amoebas with F.A. to test potential treatments. Okay. Good afternoon. I am Hernan Gentili. I am from Argentina and I work in the Santos Lab in AB3, Universidad de Buenos Aires. The work that we will present here was made with Francisco Velázquez. The aim of this work is to obtain mutants and line of the Tioxtelium discoidium to test different compounds that could be used in the treatment of FA. The model organisms used in biomedical science to understand biologic phenomena. A model organism will present the same deficiency as the patient. In addition, to biochemic, biochemical similar, similarities as less complexity. Even so, the model organism does not present the same symptom. This will reflect or give us an idea of what, ha what can happen to the patient, which is useful to understand more about the mechanisms that generate the disease, and at the same time, arrive to a treatment. We use this Costerium discoidium as a cellular model of FA, which from now on color dictate. This is amoeba that lives in the soil and feeds on bacteria and other microbes. And why did we use this amoeba? Because it has a certain future that will grant us a lot of laboratory results easily. For example, Dicti can be grown and can be genetically manipulated by a simple way. Also, Dicti has a lab cycle where it can live as a unique cell, and when these amoeba don't have food, they aggregate themselves and form multicellular organisms that can be seen with naked eye. There is an advantage is this two forms of life and their different stage as the information they provide, bringing several points of view that could be over the same phenomena. So, DICTI has been already used as a cellular model in several pathologies and has been used to discover new therapeutic agents which serve as a platform for new clinical trials. In our case, we are studying what happened in DICTI when it has the frataxin protein mutate or deficient, what is happening in the FA patient. As DICTI is a haploid, we are going to mutate its only frataxin. For a technique that allows gene edition color crispr carnide different frataxin mutants were obtained in DICTI. One of the most interesting mutants, CCH, has the frataxin truncate by the appearance of a stop codon early during CRISPR editing. The frataxin of the mutant CCH is not present in the Western blood. In this DICTI mutant, we have found deficiencies compared to DICTI wild type. The CCH mutant has shown alteration in the life cycle and in the antioxidant response. Also, it grows at a lower rate and presents decreased activity of two enzymes of Krebs cycle. 
aconitase, and succinate dehydrogenase. The phenotype observed in the dictive mutants are the same present in other FA model organisms. The amoebas with frapexin phase will help and evaluate many chemical compounds and proteins. Our system will allow us to make a lot of repetition till the target is hit, increasing the chances to discover a therapeutic answer for FA. We are, go we, are we are going to do in the lab is to face dicti with different compounds, and we are going to measure the change in the growth or in the time of formation of multicellular organisms. These parameters are altered in the mutant. Thus, if there is a rescue of a dicti phenotype with the utilization of any of the compound tested we will be in front of a potential therapeutic agent that it must be checked in other model organisms such as mammalian cells to validate these results. Thank for attention. Any doubts? Sorry, I was fumbling with my button. Thank you so much for that. As we wait for the um, questions to pile in, I was wondering if I could hog the floor for a moment. I'm curious, I'm wondering, what was your favorite part of the research that you did? I loved it all, but I'm curious, what was your favorite? Uh, he, uh, my favorite is uh, discover a, a new therapeutic agent. It's, it's, it's the future of, of my, my research. This is the... Uh, maybe, maybe I can ask you a question that was also asked to Hustos when he presented a couple of weeks ago. Have you ever, have, have you uh, given a thought of um, trying to grow this, this amoeba in low oxygen or, or in hypoxic condition and see if that rescue the phenotype like it does in, in mammalian cells? <laughs> Uh, uh, okay. Uh, no, in this moment, uh, 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 you see, you, uh, I haven't tested uh, epoxia. This this experiment uh, with epoxia at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, our next, oh, we do have another question that came up. If you have time or not, I'll do type the answer in the Q&A box. Thank you. Um, our next presenter okay. today will be Priyanka Mesra from the University of California, San Diego. And the talk will be about turning skin cells into brain cells, a new disease model of FA. So for the introduction, so myself, Priyanka Mishra, I'm a postdoc fellow in Dr. Stephanie Chalky lab. Um, first, I would like to say thank you to Fora for this great opportunity to present our work here. 
Um, so here I'm going to show um, the data regarding modeling Frederick ataxia with iPSC derived brain cells and correction of the defect by gene editing. So um, as from title, it is clear, I'm going to show some data on iPSC. So before I would like to introduce a little bit about the induced pluripotent stem cell, what this is. So the induced pluripotent stem cells is uh, uh, just stem cells which we derive from the skin or blood of the patient and we reprogram it in the lab and then differentiated these iPSC into our desired cell type. So here in this uh, whole project, we are interested in the neuron. So we are differentiating these iPSC into the neuron. And uh, here you can see this is a, uh, Dr. Yamanaka. He is first discoverer of the uh, iPSC. So uh, from our lab, uh, we did two study. One is a stem cell transplantation. So in this study, we showed that the transplantation of wild type hematopoietic stem cells into the Fredicatexia YG ATAR mice rescue the phenotype uh, and we see that the, the healthy cells which is uh, uh, transplanted is transfer uh, Fredexia to the disease cells. So now the question for us here is how the fretexine is transferred. What is the mechanism of transferring fretexines from the healthy uh, HSPC cells to the, to, uh, to the neuron? And uh, one part, uh, another part of the uh, study is because the first study showing uh, their uh, potential of allogenic stem cell transplantation. So uh, our um, another um, uh, part is uh, do doing a gene editing and uh, and this part this the this part of the data is presented by my colleague uh, Anusha on 5th uh, May. So here I'm going to show the more mechanistic. So for this, we uh, have iPSC and we uh, differentiated these iPSC into the neuron in the lab. And we also doing the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to edit these cells. And then we have a patient line and we have a gene edited corrected line as a control. So th this uh, is showing the representative picture how the neurons look like. Uh, this is a bright field and this is a staining, uh, the beta tubing staining, and then how neurons is look like in the culture. And from these iPSC, we are also differentiating uh, the uh, prepare, making a mini brain, which is called organoid. So this is a representative picture how neurons look like in the culture. So when we start the differentiation of the iPSC from patient and gene edited, we notice some striking phenotype. Uh, so when we start differentiation of uh, um, uh, iPSC to the neuron, till one week, we didn't see any differences in the, in the patient line and in the gene edited line. But after that, we noticed some uh, kind of break in the neuron, which is called blabbing. This is an apoptotic neuron. And this is uh, when we uh, increase the time the blabbing get worse in the disease, uh, 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 in the patient line as compared to the gene edited line. So this is a phenotype of apoptotic neuron. So we are curious to know the cell death because this is somehow the cell death is increased uh, due to this fetexine deficiency when the time get increased for the differentiation. And we see the significant changes in the uh, significant difference uh, in the caspase activity too. We, uh, we stain for the, uh, caspase, uh, the cell death marker and we see that as time is get increased, the, the cell death also get increased. That's why we, we see this apoptotic neuron. And not only in the 2D culture, we found the same phenotype in the 3D organoid also. And when we did the best turn, we have a clear difference between the edited and unedited cell lines. So now the question is, um, we have uh, like uh, we uh, the patient line have a prototic neuron and the corrected like line look healthy. So we try to see the mitochondrial function in that, and really very striking that uh, the mitochondrial function is also get reversed in the gene edited line, and you can see a, a lot of immune, uh, the mitosox staining in the patient line. So now overall, we have a great model system to now study the mechanistic behind the fetexine transfer from the HSPC cells to the, to the neuron. So side by side, we are differentiating microglia also, and we are going to study the transfer of uh, fetexine from the microglia cells to the neuron. Thank you.
Thank you. Awesome. Um, for the other questions compiling in, um, I want to ask you, what attracted you um, to do your research on FA? How were we so lucky? Uh, uh, actually, I can't hear. Can you please repeat the question? Sorry for that. That's okay. But um, what attracted um, you to do research oh. towards FA? Oh, okay. Uh, actually, when I joined this lab, um, uh, our first paper is already came out and we met a lot of patients uh, uh, with the fat ataxia. And after this paper, we are really very uh, like uh, uh, positive to treat the FA and I want to contribute in that. So that's part um, and, and impressed a lot to me and I move forward because I want to know the mechanistic, like how this uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells are transferring the fetaxine. So maybe the, the one of the part we are doing the gene editing and try to transplant, uh, go through, the, treat the fetaxia through, uh, through the transplantation, but side by side, we can try some drug uh, screening too and try to treat in that way too. So our lab is working in two different parts and uh, like try to uh, cure the fatic ataxia. Thank you so much. Um, and I do see some additional. Um, one was a comment that says gracias. Um, one, um, one question is, what cell types are used to make the 3D organoids and what was the phenotype? Was the phenotype limited to neurons? So for the 3D organoid, we are also using the same IPSC, the patient line IPSC and gene edited IPSC. So uh, for 2D and 3D, we have the same IPSC lines. And uh, regarding the phenotype, we have very good data on microglia too, because this phenotype is not only be limited to neuron. We see the a lot of changes in the microglia phenotype also. Great, thank you. Please, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, the next question. Um, so for the next steps, are you going to co-culture the gene edited mic microglia with the IPS neurons? Actually, uh, yeah, and that's a great question. Um, actually, we have a, a like uh, the microglia is transduced with uh, GFP fetaxine, so we have that microglia also. So we are going to do co culture of that microglia to the neuron, but that's also a great uh, uh, thing. We can try the gene edited microglia and try to do uh, because in gene edited, we see the reverse in the phenotype. So, might be we can use a gene edited microglia also and to do the co culture of the neuron too. Great, thank you. And we. <laughs> Do you have another question in the Q&A box? If you could a chance, could you answer that? Okay. Thank you. Um, the next presenter that we have today is Davide Dona um, from the University of Pardoba um, and talking about uncovering yet another function of uh, protection in the cell. Thank you, Mary, for your kind introduction. So my name is Davide Doni, and I am a FARA postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Biology at the University of Padua in Italy, under the supervision of Professor Paola Costantini. Uh, before starting with my presentation, I would like to thank FARA for this great opportunity and uh, to take part in this uh, exciting Vara Flash talk. And I would like to say also that I'm very, very proud to share with you my scientific contribution and activity in the study of Friedreich ataxia. So I will share my screen. And...
Can you see it? Yeah, it's okay. good. Perfect. Okay, so in the first part of my presentation, I would like to show you very briefly the background of our research. As you know, Friedrich ataxia is a neuro and cardiodegenerative disease associated to a depletion of frataxin, a small protein which is localized in mitochondria, organs that are responsible for the bioenergetic sustainability of the cell. A different role has been proposed for frataxin, for the frataxin function, and the most accepted one is its involvement in the biogenesis of iron sulfur cluster a key of prosthetic group, which play a pivotal role in uh, the biological system. So in this regard, it is worth to know that the cells from patient from, of Friedrich ataxia are generally characterized by an impairment of bioenergetic function. And more specifically, they share some common biochemical features like a deficit of protein containing iron sulfur cluster as prosthetic group, like for instance, complex one, two and three of the respiratory chain. They are also characterized by an overload of iron at mitochondrial level and as a consequence to increase sensitivity to oxidative stress. So although the FRADA has been recognized as mitochondrial disease, a clear cause effect relationship between frataxin depletion, iron sulfur cluster assembly dysregulation and mitochondrial bioenergetic failure has not been established yet. So with this context, the aim of our project in our group is to explore how the deficiency of frataxin is involved in the pathogenesis of Friedreich ataxia and also in the mitochondrial dysfunction. In order to gain new molecular insight on the possible function of frataxin and to focus the upstream mitochondrial defect on a more specific target. The most, one of the most important findings that we have done in our lab is about the localization of human frataxin. In fact, although frataxin is a small and soluble mitochondrial protein with no apparent transmembrane domain in, in human cells, frataxin is mainly localized associated to mitochondrial crystal, the subcompartment housing the respiratory chain complexes and also the iron sulfur cluster assembly machinery. You can see that there is a localization of frataxin by the spot of immunoglobulin labeling that we have performed. On the contrary, analyzing cells from a patient affected by Friedreich ataxia, the residual frataxin appears to be partially spread in the matrix, although in the presence of intact cysteine. This evidence strongly suggests us that whatever is the role of frataxin, this could rely on its enrichment in mitochondria crystal, so, and so that the translocation from the crystal to the matrix in pathological condition would impair the physiological function of the protein. As you know, frataxin interact with the iron sulfur cluster assembly machinery. On the basis of this result, we wonder if also frataxin could interact with the uh, complexes of the respiratory chain containing iron sulfur cluster. To address this issue, we have taken into account, uh, we have used a technique we call proximity ligation assay. PLA is a powerful technique which allows to detect with high specificity and sensitivity at the, uh, or in situ, so in cell, also at endogenous level, the interaction between protein. It is highly specific because you need to use antibodies recognizing your target protein, but it is also a highly sensi sensible technique because it uh, gives as an experimental output um, fluorescent red spot that represent a close contact between these two proteins. So to address and to explore uh, this, we have used a cardiomyocyte from human-induced pluripotent stem cells. As you can see in this model, frataxin perfectly co-localized with the free complexes of the respiratory chain containing iron sulfur cluster. And so we have performed PLA between frataxin and these complexes. As you can see, frataxin, a uh, fluorescent red spot has been detected for frataxin with all the free complexes of the respiratory chain. So suggesting a close proximity between the protein and the respiratory chain. 
But the interesting data is that the highest number of fluorescent spots has been detected toward complex one. Performing the same experiment on FRADA cardiomyocyte, we have observed that the reduction of PLA dot due to reduced level of frataxin in this cellular mo model is due uh, is a, a significant only toward the complex one, while not toward complex two and complex three. So this evidence strengthened our hypothesis that frataxin could act as a bridge between the iron sulfur cluster assembly machinery on one hand and the respiratory chain complexes on the other, and especially for complex one. So helping to focus the study of potential therapeutic approach to a more specific target. As future perspective, we have planned to extend our study on mitochondrial dysfunction in three-dimensional major cardiac macro tissue from FRADA EPSC-derived cell, which is a more complex model, but in the same time, a model of choice to interpret the data in the context of the disease. So thank you for your attention. Awesome. Wow. That was great. I, I couldn't stop listening. They're, they've all been wonderful. Don't get me wrong, but wow. Um, I have a question before the, the Q&A block, box blows up with questions. Um, what was the most surprising um, for you when you were doing all of this research? What was the most surprising findings that you found? Well, uh, I think that uh, in uh, research in general, the most surprising thing is that the unexpected one. So in this case, for me, when I have done this experiment, it is well known that in literature, protein containing iris sulfur cluster are impaired in general, but observing in detail, the molecular specific of the cellular culture that I have used, I have seen uh, the fact that it is um, restricted to a more specific target, in this case, uh, complex one. So I have also, this is uh, only a few experiments, but I have also done other that uh, rather like the, this, um, this hypothesis to a more specific target. So for me, it is, uh, it is that. At, uh, I am very surprised of the experiment that I have done because it, uh, they are not planned. And so the, this is the basis or, or the basic of uh, exploration and the curiosity. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> um, a question that just came in is, do you think the translation of Fredaxin to the matrix is secondary to the mitochondrial dysfunction? Yeah, uh, it is a very, very interesting question that because uh, uh, I think that it could be uh, um, it could be the cause or the effect in the same time. I can't give um, a precise uh, answer to that, but I, when I have analyzed the mitochondrial morphology, what uh, I have seen in this cell is that the, uh, the FRADA cells are characterized by an enlargement of the mitochondria crystal. And so it is reported that an enlargement of mitochondria crystal could be correlated with the, um, the loss of uh, functionality. So uh, in this case, it is possible that uh, the enlargement of crystal cause the uh, translocation of protaxin from the crystal to the matrix, but in the same time, it could be that the translocation from the, uh, from the crystal to the matrix of protaxin would impair the mitochondrial ultrastructure and morphology. So it could be the cause, but also the effect. Okay, thank you. I have a quick quick question. Do, yeah. With your proximity ligation, do you detect direct interaction or could this also be an indirect interaction? Well, um, the PLA uh, suggests only uh, not a direct interaction, but also a close proximity because it is due to um, limits of the technique. But uh, what I have seen is that uh, on the basis of the functionality of the antibodies that I have used, 
against complex one, two, and three, there is a difference in the number of spots. So this suggests me that uh, it could be, the frotaxin could be more proximal to complex one than complex two and complex three. In fact, now I have planned to do other experiment to verify this uh, interaction. Wonderful, thank you. Our next, excuse me, our next presenter today will be Caroline Perry from the University of Pennsylvania, excuse me, Pennsylvania. And um, the talk will be about NAD plus and new potential treatment for the heart in FA. Hi, thank you so much. Um, thank you for the introduction, Mary, and hello to everyone. Um, can everyone see my slide just to make sure? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so as Mary mentioned, I'm a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania working with Dr. Joe Bauer. And I've had the great fortune to collaborate with uh, Dr. David Lynch's lab, who some of you may know, at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia for the past almost three years. Um, I study FA because I've always been interested in how changes in your mitochondrial function can have impacts throughout your entire body. And there's no better disease that represents that than FA. Um, so my thesis project, which I'll talk to you a little bit about today, examines the potential of NAD-based therapeutics for treating phrygis ataxia with a particular focus on the heart. NAD is important for several metabolic reaction in the cell and perhaps impo most importantly for mitochondria to generate ATP. And so you can see in the top left here, um, NAD is critical for uh, several different types of reactions in the cell, and it's, it, it's very central to your general metabolism. Within the last 10 years, the scientific community has come to appreciate that normal or homeostatic NAD metabolism is critical for a well-functioning heart. For example, in human studies that examined dilated cardiomyopathy, it was found that there's a significant decline in NAD level in the heart. And so that's represented here in the black bar, non-failing heart and gray bar, di uh, dilated heart. Moreover, in a mouse model of pressure overload induced heart failure, administration of biosynthetic precursors of NAD significantly improved heart function. So this is a graph of fractional shortening, which is essentially a measurement of how well the heart is contracting. And you can see that the NAD treated mice in the green here um, experienced a smaller loss of fractional shortening compared to the untreated mice in the red, indicating that NAD boosters can be cardioprotective in heart failure. Similar improvements using NAD precursors have now been demonstrated across several different models of heart failure. So given that NAD is critical for mitochondrial function and that NAD-based therapy can prevent decline of heart function, we set out to test whether boosting NAD in FA can improve heart function like has been seen in other types of heart failure. An important part of our goal was uh, for this study was choosing a mouse model that reflects the progression of FA in the whole patient rather than just studying the heart alone. And this is because many different physiological features of FA can have an impact on heart function. Um, to accomplish this, we used a recently developed mouse model known to many FA researchers as the UCLA mice. Um, this is, model is an inducible system and uses doxycycline to turn on the expression of a transgene, which then attacks the frataxin RNA in the whole body. Um, and this depletes the frataxin over the course of two or three weeks. So rather than other models that you might be already familiar with, such as the Kiko mice, um, that mimic the most common intronic repeat mutation of the frataxin gene, this model depletes frataxin in a very different way. But the most important part of this model is that the disease features are progressive and not immediate, and the mice develop hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is the most common form of heart disease in FA. Other models of FA either do not necessarily develop heart disease, I should say other mouse models um, of FA do not necessarily develop heart disease, or it develops extremely rapidly. Um, and it's difficult to um, find a therapeutic window. So we started out our study by administering nicotinamide riboside, which is one of these NAD precursors in the drinking water, the same time that we introduced the doxycycline to the mice. So over the course of this experiment, they lose for taxin. We then monitor the mice over a period of 20 to 26 weeks um, using different methods to track the development of ataxia, diabetes, and heart failure. 
So on to some of our preliminary results. Um, to track the progression of heart disease um, developing in these mice, we used an imaging method called echocardiography, which is essentially taking an ultrasound of the heart and it allows us to measure heart function in the live mouse. The graph on the bottom left here um, is a measurement of left ventricular wall thickness, which we collected using echocardiography. If you compare the black and the gray bars, you can see that the mice in the mice without fritaxin, which is demonstrated here in the SHFXN, um, the wall is much thicker than in the wild type mice, um, indicating the development of hypertrophy. While we need to repeat the study um, with a higher number of mice for a definitive conclusion, our preliminary data indicates that the NR treated mice, the wall thickness is reduced and much closer to wild type, which could suggest that NR is slowing, uh, reducing or slowing the development of hypertrophy in these mice. Um, so that's indicated in the red bar here. And so this was really, really exciting for us to observe. And um, we were curious in exploring you know, why that might be the case. So at the conclusion of the study, we isolated mitochondria from the mouse hearts and measured oxygen consumption. Um, as you know, oxygen is used by mitochondria to produce energy. And so we were able to measure this using a machine called a respirometer, which is looks here, it looks like a little ox or something. <laughs> Um, and actually here at Penn, some research labs um, are able to obtain leg muscle biopsies from FA patients and they use this machine to look at mitochondrial respiration. And so using this technique, we found um, again that NR shown in the red here appeared to recover some mitochondrial respiration that was lost. Um, this is specifically looking at complex one respiration. So we aren't sure yet if the improvement in heart function is because of the improvement in mitochondrial function, but we're looking forward to pursuing these results further, especially since our preliminary study is very preliminary and this was a little bit underpowered when we did it the first time. Our next steps include using cell-based in vitro models to examine how nicotinamide riboside could be affecting cardiomyocytes directly, or if the improvement in heart function is due to just a whole body physiological effect such as lowering blood pressure. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. And uh, thank you to Fea for making this research possible and um, for having us all uh, here today. And I look forward to any, answering any questions you may have. There we go. Sorry, my, my friend mutters. I'm having a hard time. That was awesome. I was especially attracted selfishly, Caroline. Um, you're you're at my um home base for my neurology visits, and my ears were extra burnt up. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask you before we jump into the question: <laughs> What was the most gratifying um part of all of this? research and all the beer findings and they were very gratifying to me but what was gratifying to you as a researcher um it's always um especially when you're working in a translational model it's always it always feels really good to get something that looks like a positive result um i'll be honest i'm trying to hold back my my joy because i i want to repeat this i want to make sure that it is it is uh, it is what it looks like and so I would say um, getting just that glimmer of hope was was really exciting um, for this process. But you know, as I said, I'm I'm hope I'm hopeful that we are able to repeat this in in a much more uh, statistically convincing way. <laughs> awesome. I do. Um, this next question did come in. Um, what is the dose of NAD? used in your study? Oh, good question. So the NR is provided, um, it's at a target dose of 500 milligrams per kilogram, and that's assuming that the mice will drink four to five mils of water a day. I have a, I have a quick you question. Sure. Can you hear me? Uh, I have a quick question about, um, have, have you, about sirtuins, have you, um, uh, measure either the level of the sirtuins enzymes or their activity when you um, when you um, you know give the mice uh, you know the NAD precursor and uh, uh, what about the protein acetylation in the mitochondria? Does that change? Those are all great questions and things that we look forward to exploring in these mice. Unfortunately, we haven't had a chance to look at those things yet, but it's definitely on our list. 
we um, started with metabolomics rather than <laughs> looking at protein. So, um, but yeah, that's one of the sort of lines of questioning that we're pursuing is as a pot potential mechanism, definitely. Well, thank you so much. If more thank questions you. pour into the Q&A box, if you get a chance, would you mind answering them? Of course, thank you so much. I am. Um, as much as I would love to chat with you, I am gonna jump ahead to the next presenter. Um, three of a full schedule. Um, our next presenter is Sakhalane, Sac sorry if I mispronounced that, um, Solomon from the Brownell University in London, um, talking about can special lipid molecules in the cell membrane be a target for FA? And as a side note, I'm glad that you're feeling better from COVID. I know that you're supposed to be in session. I'm so glad you're here with us today. Uh, thank you very much for having me, and thank you for allowing me to to present at a later date. I feel that I feel a lot better. I'll just share my screen. So, can you all um, can you all see that? Yep, yeah, looks good. Okay, so um, hi, my name is uh, Sakhalin Suleiman. I'm a research fellow at, at Brunel University London uh, in England, uh, and, and I work in the Ataxia lab, which is headed by uh, Dr. Sara Anjumani Vermuni. And I'll be talking to you today about sphingolipids in Friedrichs Ataxia. A new, is it a new drug target? So uh, Friedrichs Ataxia is a debilitating disease affecting thousands of patients worldwide. Uh, despite advances in care of these patients, more therapies are needed to help these patients cope. So in my lab, we use two models of Friedrich's ataxia. As you, uh, we've developed a humanized mouse model um, in our lab, YJ, uh, YJJ and YG8 extra large. And we also have got uh, patient, uh, human patient cells uh, which we grow in the lab. Um, so the patient cells we grow in the laboratory and we can use for various uh, metabolomic assays. And the mass models are, like I said, humanized for fataxin. Um, so any, we can measure any um, effects uh, in vitro and in vivo um, to understand the molecular mechanisms surrounding fetusataxia and also the effects of particular treatments, because that is something that we're very much focused towards. A very a new and exciting avenue we are exploring is to treat this disease using something called sphingolipids. So what are sphingolipids? It may sound like something found on Mars, but is it, they are actually an important protein that makes up each and every part of our cells. So if you imagine you know, sitting on a park bench and using a pipe to blow bubbles around the park, well, sphingolipids act just like these bubbles. They travel inside your cells, carrying important information to carry out vital processes within our cells. Uh, sphingolipids are, are vital to cellular development, uh, division, and also um, apoptosis, cell death. But when these bubbles aren't formed properly, they can just collapse and then they're no fun to anyone. So just like this, there's a careful balance of sphingolipids in our cells. Uh, too much of a particular byproduct can mean toxicity to the cells. And in Friedrich's ataxia, when the fataxin gene is mutated, this leads to dysregulation of the sphingolipid pathway, um, activation of a particular gene called PDK1, uh, um, and therefore iron toxicity, and uh, which causes cell toxicity um, in patients. And we see this in other neurodegenerative disorders, um, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So for the first experiment we did, we wanted to focus on the mitochondria because we've seen the iron toxicity um, in, uh, in our assays. So, and when we looked in our control and uh, phytotaxia cells, we saw that there was a higher level of mitochondrial reactive oxygen species present. And therefore there was an increase of um, toxicity within the cells. We then moved on to using a sensitive mass spectrometry technique to look at these sphingolipids. Um, and as you can see from uh, the uh, bottom diagram, there are a variety of sphingolipids which are dysregulated 
um, in the fetal cachexia um, cell lines and in the uh, mouse models uh, compared to the healthy controls. And when we looked further at this, we then validated that at a physiological level, we can, so, sorry, we can see this at a physiological level. Um, so then we moved on to looking at the gene expression of these specific targets. And here we could see that in patient cells, the level of expression of, of particular genes involved in this finger lipid pathway are differentially regulated compared to the healthy control. And we confirm this even further by not just looking at the expression of the genes, but also at the protein quantity, which all correlate together to show the negative effect of this altered expression of these finger lipids has on free dextataxia. And this has been confirmed both in the cells that we grow in the lab and our mass model. Now, so the next stages that we're taking uh, for this is an, with a particular um, output to treatments. So, um, so our next steps will be using a variety of methods to modulate this pathway to examine the effects this has on the disease. There are a variety of drugs which we want to use to modulate these effects and if you know depend, depending on their success in vitro we can then move to in vivo work with an aim to getting this into the clinic. Furthermore we are using a viral mediated um, vet, uh, gene therapy technique to assess the to assess what the effects of down regulating these uh, pathways has on on the the treatment of Friedrich's ataxia. So by using the, all of these, we can work towards taking more drugs to clinical trial for the treatment of Friedrich's ataxia, giving hope to thousands of patients. So I'd just like to end by thanking all of you for listening, my PI and also Farah for giving me this fantastic opportunity to uh, present my research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I loved at the end how you said that you wanted to give hope to a bunch of FA patients. You certainly have given me hope and piqued my interest. I loved listening to your talk. I love blowing bubbles in the parks with my children. <laughs> well, that was a great way to start your presentation. I loved that. Um, <laughs> what was, um, um, when you were doing all of this research, what was the most interesting um, thought that you had with leading, um, with what the doors could open for the next parts of research, what was one of the most interesting thoughts that you had? Well, I think one of the most inter interesting things for me was to see that by, instead of just directly targeting for taxin, if we target this upstream pathway, that can also have a beneficial effect in the treatment of free So, you know, it's not just the, um, the protaxin gene which is affected, but also all of these other downstream and upstream pathways, which can also have a uh, beneficial um, effect for the treatment of this disease. Great, thank you. <laughs> a question that um, did come in is, do, we, do you expect that introducing sp spinal glypids themselves and the FRDA cells would have a therapeutic effect? I think it depends on what finger lipids we're talking about because we've seen that, uh, that there are specific um, uh, genes and finger lipids which have been upregulated um, in this disease. Um, and others which have been downregulated. So I think by, um, you know, it would, it would be interesting to see the effect of introducing the, the protein itself back into um, the FRDA cells, but that would be, have to be dependent on the particular um, subset of finger lipids um, being introduced. Great, thank you. Liz, um, I know that we're running short on time, did you 
have any questions or should maybe, we maybe just a just a quick one I, I was reading that ceramide uh, decreases the activity of the oxidative phosphorylation of oxidative phosphorylation and I was wondering if you think that it's maybe it, it causes you know further impairment or maybe it's a um, a consequence of the you know reduced phosphorylation oxidative phosphorylation activity because of the lack of rataxin Yes, so I would concur with that because we've seen exactly the same in our um, cellular and mouse models that there has been an increase of ceramide. Um, and of course, this is involved in the, the reactive oxygen species pathway. Um, but I think there has there's more work to do of understanding where exactly it falls um, in the pathway. If it's a side effect of um, the phytoxin uh, gene mutation or if it's something that comes before that so it's also something that leads to um, impairment of phytoxin um, production all right thank you okay i think there are no more questions we're running out of time so um I would like to thank today's speakers and also Mary for moderating. Good job, Mary. Um, and uh, also thank all of these year speakers and the moderators uh, for, um, for making this another successful um, series, Flash Talk series, um, and also for helping us uh, celebrate FA Awareness Month. Um, we appreciate um, these young investigators for their work and all the FA community for tuning in um, to the flash talks and for being involved and participating in the research. And uh, remember to keep your browser, browser open and vote. And uh, please join us again next year. Thank you. <laughs>